This video is sponsored by Brilliant, the app that teaches real science in fun bite-sized lessons. Stick around to the end of the video to find out how you can get 20% off an annual subscription to Brilliant Premium. The Permian was a wild time in Earth's history. All of Earth's landmass was coalescing into the supercontinent Pangaea, and the creatures that evolved there, as well as in the corresponding superocean known as Panthalassa, were some of my favorite animals of all time. The Permian ranged from about 298 to about 251 million years ago. That puts the start of the Permian about 68 million years before the start of the Mesozoic Era, otherwise known as the Age of the Dinosaurs. Think about that for a second. The end of the Mesozoic Era was around 66 million years ago. So that means the beginning of the Permian is farther removed from the Mesozoic than you are today. So in order to celebrate what is undoubtedly one of the weirdest geologic time periods that not nearly enough people appreciate, I partnered up with my friend Lindsay to talk about some of our favorite animals from the Permian era. All aboard the nerd train, we're talking about zoology today. Dimetrodon, arguably the most famous not dinosaur. Historically, they've been included in little dinosaur toy sets and probably dinosaur movies. Definitely land before time. Shout out Littlefoot. But of course, as we already know, this is a Permian period video, which means dinosaurs did not exist yet. Okay, so then logically you might think that Dimetrodon was the ancestor to dinosaurs. Makes sense given their look. But no, Dimetrodon was actually more closely related to modern mammals. They belong to a group called the Synapsids, the stem mammals, that would eventually evolve into mammals that are alive today, like us, which means P.S. We're also synapsids. Dimetrodon was one of the dominant predators of their time. It could get to about 12 feet long. Although they weren't our direct ancestor, they had all the characteristics that our ancestral synapsid group is known for, such as a big hole in the skull called the temporal fenestra. Synapsids uniquely have one set behind the eye sockets instead of two or none. And also specialized teeth, different teeth for different functions. This was a huge step in the mammalian lineage. It's the reason why we have different teeth today for different functions. That's actually where Dimetrodon gets their name. It translates to two measures of teeth. Now let me address the elephant in the room, that giant thing they got on their back that makes them so recognizable. That is their sail. The most common understanding of its purpose was for thermal regulation, maintaining a certain internal body temperature. Blood pumped into the sail could have warmed up basking in the sun or cooled down in a nice breeze. And they do make for some pretty sick looking fossils. Allow me to introduce you to this magnificent monstrosity, Estamanosuchus, otherwise known as the crowned crocodile because of the large bony projections that wreathe its head. There were actually a couple different species of Estamanosuchus, with Uralensis measuring in over 4 meters or 13 feet long and 2 meters or 6.5 feet tall, and the smaller Mirabilis having the more elaborate headgear. Both lived around 255 million years ago in what is now Russia. And despite its horrifying size and appearance and big sharp pointy teeth and everything else, Estamanosuchus was almost certainly an herbivore, or at the very most an omnivore, probably living somewhat similarly to how hippopotamuses do today. This is evidenced partially by the fact that Estamanosuchus is just so large, especially around the abdomen, having the capacity to house the complex digestive system necessary to digest plants. And when you really get down to it, even their teeth weren't actually that carnivore-like anyway. Lots of other herbivorous animals throughout Earth's history have had long, sharp, pointy teeth, including several other species of herbivorous therapsids during the Permian. And to draw the comparison again, take a look at this hippo skull. That thing looks like a voracious carnivore at first glance too. As for the horns, the angles and positions of them seem to indicate that they were used for display, probably for intersexual selection. But for me personally, I can't help but wonder if they would make good handles for riding one into combat. <laughs> A second ago, you might have heard me lumping Estamanosuchus into a group called Therapsids. I'm gonna go ahead and just drop a spoiler right here. All of my favorite animals from the Permian are Therapsids. And that's not only because they are just so freaking cool, but also because from an evolutionary perspective, they are extremely important. A little bit ago, Lindsay explained that animals like Dimetrodon and you are Synapsids, having one temporal fenestra. And that's what separates you from diapsids, like reptiles and birds, which have two temporal fenestrae, or anapsids, like turtles and tortoises, which have no temporal fenestrae. The therapsids were synapsids that directly led to the evolution of mammals. In fact, the root word ther in the word therapsid comes from the Greek word therio, meaning wild beast. 
The Rhapsids had a whole suite of adaptations that allowed for a higher metabolic rate and more active, high-energy lifestyles. Lots of very mammalian traits today, like upright postures, flexible necks, efficient oxygen intake, long stride lengths, and the ability to breathe while chewing can all be linked directly back to these reptilian ancestors that are commonly known as stem mammals. The Rhapsids were also incredibly prevalent throughout the Permian. And to understand what I mean by that, there's no better example than Lystrosaurus. The name Lystrosaurus literally means shovel lizard. They stood about one meter or about three feet tall, and grew to be about two and a half meters or about eight feet long. And they had a beak for snipping through vegetation, as well as two tusks for digging up roots. Just look at that adorable, ridiculous face. Now, as strange as all this may sound, Lystrosaurus wasn't the only animal with this particular dental arrangement. In fact, there's a whole clade of two-tusked herbivores from this time called Dicynodonts. But the reason why Lystrosaurus specifically is my go-to example for how insanely successful Therapsids were is because they survived through the end of the Permian and on into the beginning of the Triassic and were so unbelievably numerous that they are now the most common fossil that we find from that time, making up as much as 95% of some fossil beds. So after surviving the mass extinction at the end of the Permian, I'll talk more about that later, they became the dominant herbivore and really the dominant large land animal on the planet because there was just so little competition and very few predators who were big enough to take one down. So these guys were everywhere. Stop and imagine it for a second. Imagine a world that is completely overrun by these tusked, beaked, not quite mammalian, fleshy little dudes about the size of a large pig and they are absolutely everywhere, and then dinosaurs happened. This planet is freaking wild, man. But not all of the therapsids were weird looking herbivores. There were plenty of carnivores amongst them too. Consider for example, the Gorgonopsids, a group of saber-toothed predators that lived between 265 and 252 million years ago. These monsters were peak predators, as evidenced by their gradual increase in size over the course of their almost 10 million year existence, with rather small species like Aloposaurus, all the way to the biggest of the Gorgonopsids, Enostrancevia alexanderi, which grew to be 3.5 meters or 11 and a half feet long and almost 1.5 meters or 5 feet tall. Their skull alone was around 60 centimeters or around 2 feet long. This was a reptilian, saber-toothed dire wolf. And those teeth were about 13 centimeters or 5 inches long, which required their jaws to be specially hinged so they could open impossibly wide without the risk of dislocation. And their other teeth were interdigitated, which meant that a bite from one of these guys would have resulted in a long, jagged gash rather than just a series of holes. Like, do you understand how insane this thing is? A large Gorgonopsid could kill and butcher its prey just by biting it. And that is madness to think about. But overall, the most important thing to remember about the Therapsids is that by 251 million years ago, the Therapsid lineage had given rise to the Cynodonts, a clade that would live alongside the dinosaurs and eventually evolve into true mammals, which would eventually evolve into you. But that is a story for another time. Moving on to Helicoprion, often called a prehistoric shark, but actually belonged to a group related to sharks called the ratfish, also known as chimeras. But ratfish is much more fun to say. National Geographic called Helicoprion in particular a freaky ratfish, and I think we can all see why. They had what is often called a buzzsaw jaw, based on their fossilized teeth that are often found embedded in a spiral root. And that is what their name comes from. Helicoprion means whorl toothed shark. The placement of exactly where these tooth whorls sat was unclear for a long time. There were plenty of different hypotheses throughout the 20th century, on the top of the mouth, on the bottom of the mouth, the idea that it was even on their dorsal fin or tail swam around for a little bit. I don't know about that one. But of course, the two most likely options were at the top or bottom of the mouth. And scientists at this point just assumed, made a very educated assumption that it was at the bottom, as this made the most sense biomechanically with water drag and whatnot. And extremely well-preserved fossils found with crushed cartilage supported this idea, the lower jaw Idea. Exactly how this buzzsaw jaw was used has been a big debate, which I feel like I should mention at this point didn't 
move like a buzzsaw, just looked like an unmoving buzzsaw, just so we're quick. There have been lots of ideas on how it was used, maybe to cut through the shells of different mollusks or hard-shelled creatures, or to slash through soft-bodied prey. Maybe they had multiple different feeding strategies for different animals, depending on what they were feeling that day, like animals do today. And due to the nature of these fossilized remains, it's been difficult to determine how large they could get, considering we just have the spiral root. Estimates ranged from three to four meters long to up to seven and a half feet long, which would be a very big rat fish. And finally, one of my favorites, the trilobites, often considered the dominant group of their time. There's really two different ways that the word dominant is used when talking about animals in an ecosystem, right? There's like the big tough guys, like top of the food chain, and then there's the little guys all over the place dominant, like you can't go anywhere without seeing them. That's the dominant we're talking about here. They were everywhere for a very long time. So what? were the trilobites. The trilobites were a group of arthropods that, at first glance, don't look anything special. Like, yeah, that's definitely an arthropod. What distinguishes them from other similar arthropods alive today, like isopods, is the shape of their dorsal exoskeleton, that back. It's separated into three sections, trilobite, three, tri, a thick middle, and then those two flatter sides. This simple yet defining body form worked really well for them. They were alive from at least the beginning of the Cambrian period, about 520 million years ago, which is when most of the major animal groups appeared for the very first time, all the way until the end of the Permian period, about 250 million years ago. That's about 300 million years of this. And the thing is, they were fully developed in the Cambrian, which means they were likely around before then. They were some of the first animals on this planet and survived for that long. I'm gonna put up a number on the board and I want you to guess what it's related to. Just take a second to guess what that number could possibly refer to in this discussion. How many trilobite fossils have been found? Good guess, but no. That's how many trilobite species have been described. 25,000 distinct species scientists have described from a group of animals that were alive hundreds of millions of years ago. And we can only assume that's barely scratching the surface due to the fragile nature of the fossil record. Dude, there have been so many fossils found of trilobites that you could literally just order one on the internet. Look it up, trilobites for sale. You'll get about a thousand search results. Based on what we know about them from the fossil record, trilobites ranged in size from less than an inch long to about 28 inches long. They inhabited every marine ecosystem from the Cambrian to the Permian, and then suddenly they went extinct. These small yet resilient creatures that had already survived two mass extinctions disappeared about 250 million years ago. So why? The Permian ended 251 million years ago, and like many other geologic time periods, it ended with a mass extinction. However, the mass extinction that marked the end of the Permian was the single largest mass extinction in the history of the planet. 90% of all species on Earth were wiped out completely. That includes around 70% of all terrestrial species and around 96% of all marine species. This single mass extinction was so extensive and so widespread that it is commonly known among scientists as the Great Dying. I promise I didn't make that up. That is actually what it's called. And despite all of our knowledge about the Permian and the Triassic, the Permian-Triassic extinction event is still somewhat of a mystery. We just don't know exactly why it happened. Now there is good evidence for sudden, extreme, and long-lasting volcanic activity that would have triggered rapid climate change, but that model doesn't answer all the questions that we have about the Great Dying, nor is it solely sufficient for explaining the sheer magnitude of this event. And while there is also the contact metamorphism hypothesis, which essentially states that that much magma would have burned up a lot of the coal and other stuff in the rocks below, which would have released a lot more greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide than the volcanoes possibly could have by themselves, and that would explain a lot of the rising temperatures and the ocean deoxygenation and acidification that we see, as well as some other cool stuff, as it stands, we just don't have one single solid explanation for why life on Earth almost came to a grinding halt. So, you know, just have fun sleeping at night knowing that. And now, in honor of the great dying, I think it's time for this video to come to an abrupt end as well. Thanks so much to Lindsay for talking about some of her favorite Permian animals with us. Lindsay is a zoologist, so if you want to learn more cool animal facts, be sure to visit her channel. I'll put links to all of her stuff down in the description as well. And with that, I'm Forrest Valkai. Thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, and all the other stuff you do here on YouTube. Please exit through the gift shop on your way out, pick up one of these sweet t-shirts, have an awesome rest of your day, and never stop learning. Bye-bye!
And now a word from our sponsor. Brilliant is an everyday learning app that puts real math and science lessons right in the palm of your hand. Fundamental lessons like introductory algebra or scientific thinking are huge barriers for people who want to get into STEM. So Brilliant offers lessons in those, as well as advanced topics like AI, data science, astrophysics, and neural networks. And they even add new lessons every single month, so there's always more to learn. But don't just take my word for it. You can try everything that Brilliant has to offer absolutely free for a full 30 days just by going to brilliant.org slash or using the link in the description below. And because Brilliant loves my subscribers so very much, they're offering an extra 20% off an annual subscription to Brilliant Premium to the first 200 people who sign up using that link. So whether you're a new learner getting started in science or you're already a nerd and you just want to get nerdier, Brilliant is the app for you. And you can try it today for free by going to brilliant.org slash forestvalkai or using the link in the description below. And hurry, because the first 200 people to sign up get 20% off an annual premium subscription.